eBay sellers, you have landed on episode 149 of eBay the right way. Today's date is January 24th, 2024, and Eileen, the book lady, is back to answer your book selling questions. Before we cut away to Eileen, I do have a pretty big personal announcement, and it's a happy one this time. Some of you may have seen on Facebook that I have a new man in my life and noticed that I changed my profile picture to the two of us. I wanted to give you a personal update because, well, I'm a real person just like you and the past few months have been pretty tragic for my family, so it's time for some good news. Here is the condensed story. And I will continue to give updates on this situation as it progresses, both here and on YouTube, definitely posting photos and videos on YouTube because, well, that's not possible on a podcast. So we're going to go back to 1979 when we were teenagers. We were each other's first love. Some of you know that I was a gymnast back in the day. Our coaches knew each other in the gymnastics world and became business partners and opened a gym in Atlanta. My coach was from Georgia. The other coach was from the Midwest. He came to Georgia bringing along a very handsome teenage boy to continue his training and live in his home. As high-level athletes often do, they live with their coach in a different state. This very good-looking, charming athletic boy and I became smitten with each other almost immediately. And we went to different high schools, so we mostly saw each other at the gym, or he would come to my house on his blue Honda motorcycle. Yes, a hunky boyfriend who rode a motorcycle. We were like two peas in a pod. It was sweet, innocent, the perfect teenage romance. That perfect one you never forget. He was the standard by which all others were measured. So fast forward to 1981 when his coach suddenly became ill and my boyfriend had to go back home to the Midwest. And it was devastating for both of us because our time together was not over. We didn't want to be apart. We had each lost our best friend with no warning. First love, first heartbreak. All for reasons beyond our control. We felt so helpless and hopeless. We tried to keep in touch, writing letters and talking on the phone, But back in the day, there was no internet, long-distance phone calls were very expensive, and we were about 700 miles apart. It was a traumatic and impossible situation. If you have ever had a broken heart, you can relate. Our parents chalked it up to puppy love, told us to get over it, and move on. So we did. After he graduated from high school, he joined the Marine Corps and was part of Special Operations Marine Force Recon, serving with the 1st and 2nd Recon Units. Military people will know what all that means. (laughs) He traveled all over the world, bravely serving our country for 10 years, and somehow he survived a great deal of very dangerous work. After learning this about him, I think he's the most courageous person I've ever known. So we checked in with each other every 10 years or so, but we're always in a committed relationship with another person. So we didn't even consider that we could possibly end up together. And we lived in different parts of the country. Interestingly enough, Our lives have been running on a parallel like railroad tracks, 
major life events happening the same year or even just months apart. Fast forward to 2014, he popped up on Facebook and sent me a friend request. We were happy to be reconnected, at least online, and be able to watch each other's lives. We didn't really communicate, again, because we were in committed relationships with other people, and that would not have been appropriate or ethical. We are both wired to keep our commitments. So we would wish each other happy birthday here and there and like each other's photos. Then in 2023, his wife of 20 years passed away after being ill for several years, and he was her primary caregiver. He is such a good man. And I kept seeing his posts about how distraught he was, how he missed his wife dearly, and so on. And I thought to myself, I know what he's going through. I went through this in 2020 when my love of 15 years died. Maybe he just needs someone to talk to. I know when I was in that situation, just talking to a good listener was helpful. Grief is so hard. Also, my sister was going through the exact same thing, losing her spouse, and she appreciated me listening and being her emotional support person. So I reached out to him on Facebook Messenger, and we chatted a bit, and then switched to texting because we didn't want Zuckerberg to know all of our business, and then switched to phone calls. We were on the phone two to three hours every single night for two months, reconnecting, talking about our lives, and just talking in general. And what unfolded in those conversations was astounding. The miracle is that we never stopped thinking about and caring about each other, and that we are so astonishingly compatible and on the same page about almost everything in life. He is a highly intelligent, successful entrepreneur, and we have the same curious, creative, analytical, opportunity-seeking mind for business. He is a pillar of his community, well-respected, has many friends all over the world, and has raised independent, successful, and confident children. He's a voracious reader. We are passionate about the same health foods, physical fitness. We have the same moral compass. Just the way we live our lives is the same. We loved each other as teenagers and both love and respect the adult the other one has become. So, we mustered up the courage to meet in person in a neutral city a couple of weeks ago after not seeing each other for 42 years. We think we were pretty brave to have done that. You know that saying, if your dream doesn't scare you, it isn't big enough? Well, this was pretty big and kind of scary for both of us. And we have each other on the iPhone Find My Friends app, you know, where you can share your location so friends or family can see where you are. And on the day we met, we watched those two little blue dots getting closer and closer together, texting each other about how fast our hearts were beating. I mean, this was something you would see in a movie. Once we laid eyes on each other in the airport, let me tell you, <laughs> it was one epic hug. And it was like no time had passed. Two peas back in the pod together, which is a miracle after 42 years apart. So the moral of the story here is that I have found my person. And he was there all along. But the timing just wasn't ever right until now. We are making big plans to be together. And I hope you all can be happy for us. Nothing with my eBay work will change. In fact, he will be a huge asset because he thinks reselling is cool and has different knowledge than I do. A very smart man. 
and pretty soon I will be living in a different part of the country and get to see different types of items to resell. We are both ready for this chapter of our lives and an adventure together. Okay, that's the story and I'm sticking to it. I'll keep you posted on this situation because things are about to get even more epic. Okay, on to the chat with Eileen. Welcome back, listeners. I have a repeat offender with us today. (laughs) Eileen, the book lady, back to answer your book questions. So how are you doing this morning, Eileen? I'm doing well. Great. Okay. Well, we put a APB out on the Facebook group uh, for people to submit their questions. And then Eileen mentioned that um, some folks just message her directly. So she's been keeping track of all those. So um, if you have not done a book sale or a library sale, or you just are overwhelmed with what to choose, um, maybe this episode will help you. So we are going to start off with um, where do you find most of your books? What are your best sources? Okay, definitely used book sales. And um, to find a used book sale near you, go online to booksalefinder.com and you can search by, search by state and they have a calendar up there and that will tell you what's you know within driving distance of you all over the country. So Uh, That has been a great resource for me. But in my city, we are really lucky to have a charity that runs a used book sale at least eight times a year, sometimes more. That's where I probably get 90% of my inventory. And what's nice about the sale that they do is they have dealer day first. So they have the first day is dealers only, and then the next day is open to the public. And if you want to shop at the dealer sale, you pay $50 to shop there. Um. And some other used book sales will do the same thing. And I have always found that to be worth every penny, every penny. So um, I always go to the dealer book sale. Um, I'm usually first or second in line. It's 10 minutes away from me, but people come from, you know, two and three hour drives away to attend this book sale. I think it's probably one of the biggest ones in the country. We've got usually an inventory of 70,000 books there. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's constantly replenished in between the sales. Um, they, they're a charity that sends books all over the world, and then they fund those heavy shipping containers by selling books as well. So I get 90% of my books there. There's a couple other fairly local sales that happen once or twice a year. I will uh, hit those as well. Um, find them at estate sales. I've had a couple private picks with books, which is wonderful. That's always fun. Um, and very, very rarely will I go to a thrift store. Um, they're just crap around here. So, mm-hmm. but um, I just had a private pick a couple weeks ago. 500, almost 500. I think I ended up with 485 1950s to 1980s paperback science fiction. Mm-hmm. That's a lot of books. <laughs> yes. so, but that was really fun. I got some really good inventory. Great. Well, I... Um tried your way and I went to a library sale because I live across the street from a library and I was like well that's super convenient so I joined the friends of the library for I think it was $25 yeah um but basically you get first uh the first day is just friends of the library yes so um I found a few things it was just it seemed overwhelming to me yeah Um, I found a nice um, DVD set, a Ken Burns PBS set, and um, I was, I don't want to say shocked, I was kind of surprised at how many young people were in there, like moms with their kids, Hmm. Uh, not necessarily homeschool stuff, but just to buy, Yeah, get books for their kids. You know, they pull them in wagons and stuff, <laughs> filling up their wagon with books. Um, so, so how often how often is that library sale held? Do you know? Oh, I think every quarter. Okay, that's good. But, yeah, some do once a year, some do <laughs> once a month. You just you have to check and see. So if if you paid your friends of the library fee for the year and you can go three more times, that's pretty good. Well, that's just that branch. They have them at oh, all different really? branches. So like the downtown main branch. Uh, they might have it once a month. 
it, it's kind of like all the branches operate independently, but okay. if you're a friend of the library, you can go to any of them. That's good. Actually, that could be a really good investment. Yeah, absolutely. If, if you know what you're looking for. So I did buy a couple of things for myself <laughs> yeah. and, um, but yeah, it's, it's knowing what to pick and I didn't see anybody in there scanning stuff. It's, it seemed like if there were resellers in there, they were very well behaved and they yeah. just knew what they wanted. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, next question is at used book sales. How do you compete with the people using scanners? Okay. Um, nobody likes those scanners, do they? <laughs> um, they can be really aggressive. Um, I don't, I don't consider myself in competition with them. Um, most of them are, um, doing the really high volume, low profit business, low margin business for, for Amazon. Um, but what's kind of funny is they have this app and you'll hear them scanning. And if it hits a book that they can make a certain amount of profit on, it'll give the eBay ka sound. So you, you're thinking, oh, I got a sale. And you look in your pocket and nope, nope, that wasn't my phone. <laughs> Somebody their, else. Their scanners keep going ka-ching, ka-ching, ka-ching. Um, but I don't consider that I'm in, in competition with them. A lot of them are looking for textbooks and I don't sell textbooks. Um, a lot of them seem to go to the cookbook section, and so I don't go there. So if there's a lot of scanners at the sale, and there typically aren't that many, most people are hand hand picking. Um, I'll just go where they're not. Um, the other thing is they're looking to sell individual books, and one of my niches is selling a book set. So if they come across book seven of a 10-book series, they're less likely to pick that up but it's easier for me to pick up because I'm going to save that and build up the series. And you have great patience doing that. I see on your sales, you're like, um, you know, you'll find two or three from the series and then you'll just wait until you find the rest of them. And I just think that takes a lot of patience and, and faith in knowing that you're going to find the rest of them. Well, my patience is fading for that. Um, <laughs> I, I typically now will not pick up volumes unless the set is, near complete, like 75% complete. I'm tired of storing the books. Um, and a lot of the ones that made me really good money two and three years ago just aren't holding the value. So I ended up donating back a bunch of kind of orphaned volumes that I just never finished building the set for because it wasn't worth it to try and build the set when the price had fallen. Uh, so I'm absolutely still doing sets, but but just being a little more careful about that. Okay. And then back to the book scanners. Um, I, I sold books on Amazon back when all that started in, I guess it was 2010 when mm -hmm. it, third party sellers could do that. And everybody had those scanners. And I'm of the belief that the human mind is the best tool because yes. you have to tell that scanner what you want it to pick for you. Yes, and, you know, sales rank on Amazon is a thing, but um, I just found that intuitively choosing and experience and the weirder, the better and things yes. that are really limited in number, like these cookbooks on my uh, YouTube video yesterday, there were several. Um, one was a Ukrainian Easter cookbook. Now, that's something you're not going to see every day. Yeah, I might have seen that at one point. Yeah, um, yes, you, truly. And especially with the cookbooks, the the spiral binding, the ones that, you know, the 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 ones from the Deep South do really well. The, the spiral bound Deep South vintage church cookbooks. Like the church cookbooks and all that. Yes. Um, somebody else had a cookbook from St. Louis, Missouri that was, I don't know, maybe 100 years old. Wow. And, um, it sold for about $30. Yeah. But- People think, oh, if I sell books, I need to have a scanner like everybody else. No. And um, you have to, you have to tell it what to pick for you. Your brain is what makes the decision. Right. The scanner just brings up information that you have to decide: um, is this a a go or a no go? So, for the listeners, don't think you have to invest in some expensive. Uh, app or something like that. It, it's really just like everything else, experience, yes, practice, uh, paying attention to what sells and looking for those things that are truly limited in number um, that I hate to say rare because that word is so overused. It is. It's like, it's like awesome. Awesome is not awesome anymore. 
<laughs> but, no more awe and awesome. No, yeah. awesome is like a gorgeous sunset over the Grand Canyon, but no, it's not that anymore. But um, this is just another category that takes practice, I think. Yeah. Okay, so that's my speech on scanners. Okay, here's a good one. How do you get rid of smoke or musty odors? Smoke, I don't. I don't buy books that are smoky. Um, every now and then I'll, you know, bring one home and then I realize it smells like smoke and I I just get rid of it. Um, not messing with the smoke. Uh, I've never found anything rare enough or special enough to warrant me trying to figure out how to clean that up. A lot of the books I get are musty. Um, not moldy, but musty. So um, I, if it's a really intense musty odor, I try not to pick it up. But uh, you know, sort of a medium to low musty odor is pretty common among used books, especially if people have been storing them in their garage or their basement. I will just put them outside on a sunny, dry afternoon, and that takes care of a lot of it. Some of the odor still might remain, and I just list that and put that in the listing. It has a slight musty odor, and people still buy those. Have you ever tried putting them in the freezer? I haven't, I, I've heard the trick and I haven't tried it, but you know what? I guess I ought to test that out. Yeah. I've, um, I've heard you put it in like a plastic bag with cat litter, like okay. they're separate the bag, you know, you okay. don't cover it with cat litter, but, um, and that will absorb it. And then something I tried on my own with, um, a musty paper item was, um, the shoe inserts that have the charcoal in them. Oh, what a great um, idea. I, I had a couple of those in, into pieces yeah. and put it in a, a Ziploc in the freezer for a few days and it worked. That okay. charcoal just sucked that odor right out. I'm writing that um, down because I'm going to, I'm going to have to get some of those. Yep. <laughs> Cause I was like, I was at Walmart looking for something and I'm like, these charcoal. Cause that's, you know, that's something that can remove odors, even charcoal briquettes. And you just have to experiment with different things. I yeah, think. I'm going to try um, that. That's great. I'm, I'm like you with the smoke. I just, I'm just not going to buy it. Yeah. Because if you do, and then it's cross contaminated with something else, that odor can jump over to something else. It can. And, um, some people have very sensitive noses and yes. they can smell things you might not be able to smell. So yeah. I feel like if, if I can smell it, Somebody with a sensitive nose is going to be able to smell it even more. Yes. <laughs> so, okay. Now that leads us into what about moldy books? Can they okay. be rescued? Um, maybe. Um, if it's black mold, no. Mm -hmm. I do not mess with black mold. I we actually had a, a leaky pipe in our house a few years ago that went undetected and it created black mold. And I got very sick for a very long time. Mm -hmm. So I do not mess with black mold and some books will have like dark spots on the cover, but it's storage soiling. It's not black mold. And the only way to tell the difference really is just experience. Also, if it's just storage soiling um, that resembles mold, you can take a damp cloth or a, a, like a Clorox wipe and wipe that down and that'll come right off or, or you can tell that it's not mold. If the black spots or actually any color mold spots are on the actual paper pages, no, I don't mess with that at all. I just throw that right away or don't even bring it home. Um, but some books get, I, I guess it's mold. It's like white spots. And I guess it's white mold on the cover. Mm -hmm. And a Clorox wipe always takes that <clears throat> off right away for me. Just come, comes right off. And so that that's not a problem. So it just depends. But um, yeah, I would just say treat treat mold with great respect and fear <laughs> because yeah, really you don't want to mess around with that black mold you really don't yeah you don't um and this I don't think this is on your list I haven't seen it but um have you ever found money in books I haven't found money but I have found uh a couple of love letters um and I found uh a poem written in 1944 by a, a, a private overseas in World War II. And it's a poem and it's entitled, Am I Alone? And he's like pondering his life and then decides that he's got a wife and child at home and they're worth fighting for. And so he's not alone. It is it is so sweet. So I found some some really cool personal writings in books. Okay, that's great. Um, I found I found airline tickets 
like back in the day when you actually got a printed ticket. Yeah. Um, mostly like snotty Kleenexes. <laughs> yep. I find bo- I find boarding passes. Um, yeah, that's what I mean. Boarding yeah, pass. Boarding pass. Um, yeah. And I did find two fifty dollar bills in a book, and in the person had written in the front cover, you know, happy birthday, blah blah blah, and the spine was not even cracked. They, yep, they never opened that book. They never opened it. They <laughs> never found the money, and somehow it stayed in there. And then you got uh, it. And I've just you know found little notes jotted down and um, yeah. all kinds of you know interesting bookmarks and stuff yeah. like that. So. Um, you just never know. I, I photos. Said, I found some old photos. Yeah. 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 Um, I've said this before, and you know this, that people used to hide their money in Bibles. Yeah. So you, you'll see people at the thrift store just flipping through the Bibles. Like, is there anything in here? Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, I think everybody knows about that now, but um, just, just throwing that out there. You never yep. know when you might be at a garage sale or something and People, the people having the sale didn't know to look there and there could be cash in there. So um, now the cat's out of the bag on that. But okay, moving on to the next question. What research tools do you use? Um, yeah, and that was posted on the Facebook page. Okay. Um, obviously the sold comps. I mean, that's that's where I go first and that's while I'm shopping. Um If it doesn't show up in the sold comps while I'm shopping, I will sometimes still buy it because just experience tells me this this could be something. Uh, Then when I get home, of course, I go right to Terapeak. uh, And sometimes it's not even on Terapeak and I end up at Worth Point a lot. There's a few books I've sold that have only sold maybe three copies like in 15 years. Mm -hmm. And so that's where Worth Point has been really, really helpful to me. Google Lens will sometimes give me information that those don't. I'm not quite sure why. Um, and then I will look on Amazon and Abe Books, and there's one other, I forget what it is, to see what they have up for sale, what might be active there. And that kind of tells me what my what my competition is. Yeah, I think that's helpful just to look across several different platforms um, you can sell books on Etsy, can't you? If it's yeah, different. and in fact, I do. I have a small Etsy shop, and if something won't, I don't think it'll do great on eBay, but has a, a strong nostalgia factor. I will sell it on Etsy, and I, I'll do better there. Yeah. So you want to, if you're having trouble pricing it, you want to look at several different sources. Yes. Um, rather than just because I learned this selling on Amazon that um, people will jack up the price on a book to something ridiculous and that means it's not in stock yes they just leave the listing active yes so for the seo benefits and when they find it again then they'll change the price and the condition and all that but they just leave those listings there because it's like why is this book thirty dollars on ebay and two thousand on amazon that's not real nope it is not real Listeners, that's not real. <laughs> so that's why you want to look across different platforms to make sure the pricing is consistent. Yes. Or at least close. Yes. Okay. Now, do you uh, pull up Terapeak on your phone? I don't know how to do that. So there's a way to do that? There is. I will put that at the end as the trivia okay. question. <laughs> um, there is a way to do it through your phone. So. Okay. That would be extremely helpful. Great. Yeah, I think, you know, you have to have a good internet connection, but yeah. you can't do that. Okay, good to know. Okay, um, now, do you ever repair books? Uh, a little bit. I will uh, tape up rips in a paperback, like on the cover and the spine. I will tape dust jackets that have a rip and always, always, always disclose that in your description. You've got to tell them that you've repaired it with tape. Um, and then sometimes on a hardcover, the spine, the the cloth or the uh, uh, the cloth covered boards or the leather, or whatever it is, will peel a little bit. And sometimes I'll use a little white glue to stick that back on on a really old book. But full scale restoration um, and bindings and stuff, I don't I don't mess with that. I just take really good photos and write really good descriptions so that the buyer knows exactly what they're getting. Yeah, I always hesitate to tape anything up. 
Cause like yeah. maybe the buyer might want to do it their way or not do it at all. Or maybe they want to put it in like a plastic slip cover or something. Yeah. I mean, don't mess with it if you're not sure, because again, they, they're maybe more of an expert than you are. Right. Yeah. yeah. Collectors, they want to make any repairs or just leave it as is. So yeah. and it, that's so counterintuitive for a seller to <laughs> yeah. sell something that's like ripped up and torn and yellowed and, um, but, yeah. you know, the older something is, somebody yeah. posted on the Facebook group a ledger that uh, was from 1886, I think, like a store ledger. And oh, cool. she got $100 for it. And it was just ripped up and the pages were falling out. And, you know, some collector wanted that. Yeah. So um, this is not on, on your list, but I'm going to ask you, what is the highest selling price you've gotten on a book. And I think it's that Charlie and the Chocolate Factory one. No, got Charlie, and the, or something. Charlie and the Chocolate Factory got returned because I made an error in the listing. Right. I haven't okay. listed it yet. The highest I ever got for a book was about a year ago and it was um, $600. I think I may have talked about this on your last podcast. It was a limited edition. I think they only printed a thousand hardcover in a slip case. It was a movie tie-in with some fantasy movie or something that had a cult following. And the director or the producer was a guy named, is a guy named Guillermo del Toro. And fans of his will know his name. I didn't know who he was. And he signed it. So um, I looked that up and found nothing in the solds when I, when I found the book for $3. And I thought, you know, I can't lose. A slip case signed limited edition got it home um and that was where worth point was so valuable that's the only place i found that and only like a handful maybe four or five had sold um they had sold i think i i listed mine near the top of the range and that's what it sold for and it sold for $600 and it only took 3 weeks and then my second highest book sale was just a few weeks ago it was, I sold it for $299. It was a hardcover children's vintage book from the forties with a dust jacket. And it was 23 of a, of a one through 23 series. And they printed so few of the 23rd book that they're really hard to find and they go for a lot. So I did well with that. Very good. Yeah. yeah I don't remember if you talked about that on the last podcast, but who cares? Right. People like to, to know what's possible and <laughs> I talk about my autograph book all the time. <laughs> yeah, I would too if I got a thousand dollars. Yeah, and now thinking back, I'm like, I should have put that on auction. Oh well, I just didn't think about it because I'm not, I'm not really an auction person. But um, I'm not either. Yeah, I just, you know, you have those sales that stand out, and people love to hear that because it could be anybody that stumbles yes. on something like that. You know, I could be. I the sell thing a lot find. of books. Yeah, I sell a lot of books between 80 and $200, mm -hmm. you know, well, a lot, you know, uh, you know, usually twice a month or more, I sell a book for over $100. And then I sell book sets sometimes, maybe, maybe six times a year, I, I will sell a book set that goes for between two and $400. So that's, Excellent. you know, that stuff's out there. Yeah, the stuff's out there. Yeah. And there's a lot of people that just don't want to do books. They yeah. they feel like maybe if they're not a reader, yeah. that they don't have the knowledge to do it. Yeah. Um, but it's really like anything else. You just learn. You do. You and know? you'll make lots of mistakes, but books are cheap. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Okay. So the next question is, what is the difference between a first edition and a first printing? And how do you oh. identify that? Okay. The first thing I would do is I would direct your listeners to biblio.com, B-I-B-L-I-O.com. They have an amazing article there um, that is going to go into way more depth than I can here. But a first edition is basically the first time they've ever printed that book. And um, the first printing is the first print run. So let's say, okay, they think they'll sell 5,000. So they print 5,000 copies of that book. Um, then they realize they're selling really, really fast. Um, and that was the first printing, first edition, first printing. They realize they're selling really fast and they, and they need to print more. 
So then that becomes the first edition, second printing. And then a few years down the road, they realize there's some mistakes in that book that they need to correct. And that becomes the second edition. And then with the, with the subsequent printings. When you open the copyright to the copyright page, uh, you will see a year, let's say 1958. If you see more than one year, if you see 1958, 1961, 1964, that is not a first edition because those were subsequent editions because they put a new copyright on it when they made changes. So if you only see one year, um, that is probably the first edition. Uh, and then you're looking for something called a printer's line. And it's a, it's just numbers across um, the page. And it might be in, it's usually in descending order. So 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. And the lowest number is the print run. So if it's published 1965, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, you've got a first edition from 1965, which was also the first edition, first printing. Um, then when they print more books, they'll take that one away and it'll go to the two. And then you know that that's your second printing. Uh, and then some actually tell you, I, I pulled a Julia Child cookbook here because I wanted to look at it and describe it. So yeah, so I have a Julia Child cookbook, copyrighted 1961. That was her famous cookbook, Mastering mm -hmm. the Art of French Cooking. But it, it says copyright 1961. And then it says 12th printing, August 1966. So what I have there is a first edition, 12th printing because it just told me that. Okay. Um, first edition, first printing are obviously the most valuable. They're also the most limited run that that book probably did. Um, but other editions and other print runs can also carry value. Um, I've sold books that have been like first edition, 12th printing, or like this one here, whatever. Uh, and, and they'll do okay. Um, some books carry value for different reasons. And so just because it's not a first edition, first printing doesn't mean it isn't valuable. It's, you know, it's like trying to nail jello to the wall. The, the, the hard and fast <laughs> rule is the early, <laughs> the hard and fast rule is the earlier the printing and the edition, the more value it carries, but there can be other factors as well. Okay. Um, this isn't on the list and I've forgotten. Did you have a professional career dealing with books or is all this self-taught just for reselling? Um, I did not. My first career was as a Russian translator for the government. Then I raised oh my, my gosh. Kids. <laughs> yeah, right. And then I raised my kids and uh, did a whole bunch of freelance writing. So I've always been around writing and books writing. and words and okay. stuff. Yeah. Okay, well, let's go back to the Russian translating. <laughs> so how many languages do you speak? I don't even speak Russian anymore. Oh. <laughs> I always loved languages. I got my college degree in it, um, began working for the government shortly after college. L absolutely loved it, loved the whole thing. But it's been uh, way too long, uh, over well over 30 years. Uh -huh. um, and uh, cl coming up on 40. And so that's gone. <laughs> and, yeah, and if you don't use it, you lose yep. it. <laughs> yep. <laughs> okay, yeah, I couldn't remember. I, I thought you had a connection to writing or editing or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, that, that fits in really well with your specialty here. Okay. We're going to move on to another question from the Facebook page. What book trends are you looking for in 2024? Um, I am looking for book series series, not single volume series that have been adapted into streaming series or movies. Um, so the first one that comes to mind is Netflix's um, Bridgerton, next yes. Netflix's Virgin River, um, the Dune franchise, Shadow and Bone, Sweet Magnolias. There's a, there's a, quite a few of them across the board. Um, if you know they're in development, start start looking for the books, because when that first drops on Netflix or in the movie theater or wherever it is, is when the price is going to be highest and the demand is going to be greatest. Um, when Virgin River first came out, I put together a few sets and I sold a complete series. Um, and I sold and there were like 20 books in that. I sold them for about $150 in the paperback version. Um, I'm been sitting on one now for almost a year. I have it listed for like a hundred and a little over a hundred and it hasn't moved yet. 
um, because we're in what the fifth season of Virgin River or whatever it is, and it will sell, but not like it did at first. So um, always, if you if you can pay attention to what's in development from books, that can be a really good clue what to look for. Um, and then everything else in terms of trends, I just seek out niches that are pretty much evergreen. Uh, and for me, those are fantasy and science fiction, cookbooks, obscure spiritual religious books, uh, Bibles, vintage children's series, manga, and any kind of like collectible box set. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I love finding those box sets because, oh, they're all together. Yep, exactly. <laughs> That's great. Um, are you familiar with Robert V. Parker? I am. Okay, yes. so um, I'm mentioning that because, you know, you get into something, a s- series of movies or whatever, and you don't even realize it's based on a book. <laughs> right. There are um, a series of movies with Tom Selleck playing uh Jesse Stone. Yes, I've uh, seen them. Yeah. The movies are great. Anything Tom Selleck puts his name on is, is yes. just good. And I was like, I didn't even realize this was based on books. Now yes. I wish I had <laughs> read the books first, but um, I don't mind looking at some Tom Selleck eye candy. I know, right? Watching the right? movies. <laughs> and they're they're good. There's like no profanity and it's a good story. And it's filmed in uh like New England. So it's really nice scenery yeah so um for those of you out there looking for something uh jesse stone yes yes and um, longmire is another series that came from books. Yes, yes yes yep but you know what the books are always better i will just i will just throw that out there the books are always better i know but you're like when you're scrolling netflix yep. or whatever, what have i not seen and who do i yeah. what actors do i like you know well and- i loved the virgin river books um, yeah. I read a lot of small town romance. I love the Virgin River books. And after the first season of Netflix, I was like, nope, nope, nope. They changed way too much. They're doing stupid things with those characters. I'm out. Yeah. And like um, Cedar Cove with Andy McDowell. Yes. Um, yep. Based on Debbie McComer, her books. Yeah. yeah I sold um, a couple of those sets as well. Yeah. So um, side note, Andy McDowell is from Gaffney, South Carolina, like an hour okay. from me, like, just oh, up the road. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I got sucked into that. Um, I had never seen it and watched that over the holidays. And it it's a good production. Um, I think it's Hallmark Channel. Yes, it was. But, yeah. um, you know, same thing, beautiful scenery. It's filmed in Canada. And so they film it in the warm months. So you never see snow. You never see winter. It's always beautiful, um, green and flowers and everything. But um, that's another good one. I like that. Yeah, that was good. I enjoyed that. Yeah. Okay. Um, moving on to the next question. How do you handle signed copies that come your way? And this is from Kathy Combs. I have come across a signed book from Charlene Harris that was for sale at my library. Do you authenticate the signature? How do you put the price point for signed copies? Um, yeah, so just elaborate on all that. Okay. <laughs> so signed books are not automatically, you know, a golden ticket. Um, most of the time, I would say they really don't add much value to a book. Um, in the case of Charlene Harris, the books are mass produced. I mean, massively produced. Uh, and she signs a lot at author events. So a signature in her book, uh, a signature, a signed book by her is not really that special. Um, it will probably sell for a couple dollars more and a little bit faster than a book that doesn't have those attributes. But um, it, it's like a lot of authors. There's really not a whole lot of added value. Some authors do, do, do carry a lot of value. Uh, Stephen King, if you get a signed Stephen King, uh, even if it's written to, you know, to Joe, to Joe, to Joe Smo, best wishes, Stephen King it will still still sell really well, even though it's a personalized dedication. Um, there are some authors like him that just, that, that people really seek out. He's got so many fans and to, I don't, I don't pay to authenticate signatures. What I usually do when I'm, when I have a, the rare signed book is I will go on the solds or worth point or wherever and look at another book that sold with that person's signature and usually I eyeball it and it looks authentic and I call it good, you okay. know, and I'll put in the description. I have not authenticated this signature, but to the best of my knowledge, it looks authentic and I'll let the buyer decide. Um, if speaking of Stephen King, 
if you find Stephen King books, they're not all uniformly valuable, but some really are. And they're a lot of them are like um, second edition, fourth printing that are valuable. So there's that edition printing thing again. There's a Stephen King website. I don't know the address of it. That is all about collecting his books and they can really uh, help you do a deep dive into what in terms of Stephen King books and editions and signatures and formats are, are the most valuable. Well, and something um, I learned from you was his uh, books under the names uh, Richard Bachman. Oh, yes. Yeah. And that's in one of my Bolo books because I got that from you. Yes. Um, so people don't realize that he wrote, was that when he first started writing, it was under? No, he was, he was selling so much under Stephen King. He didn't want to oversaturate the market with his name. And he thought, let me just see if I'm as good as I think I am and do a different name. And they did great too. So yeah. 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 And, and then, then um, as far as the autographed books, I know, uh, and this is in one of my Bolo books, is the uh, Anthony Bourdain cookbooks that yes. are signed because um, I, he took his own life. I think it was 2018 around there. And any of his signed cookbooks just skyrocketed yes. in value. Julia Child is one to watch for a a, a, a a reseller that I run into a lot at the book sales, uh, found a, a, a Julia Child cookbook with her signature in it, and she sold it for $1,200. Oh, my gosh. So Julia Child is one of those as well. Um, and then you have to watch out because some of them are are signed like by something called an auto pen. So it looks like a signature, but it's not a real signature. I mean, it's like done automatically. Mm -hmm. So biblio.com has a really good article on book signatures as well and what to look for with that okay to tell if they're genuine and valuable and it, it it you know is there does it look like there's been an impression made by a pen and this and that and so it, it can tell you more about how to look at signatures okay great um let's see i think you covered all of the questions she had and if you hear a cat in the background <laughs> I'm breaking my own rule of no pets while we're recording um I'm cat sitting and oh boy it just seemed to come out at the most uh, <laughs> inopportune times like when I'm recording something so yeah I have a, a little cat friend with me here so um okay moving on how do you store your books cardboard boxes on shelves or something else Okay. Once books are listed, if it's a single book or a very small set, they go upright on bookshelves. Um, and I have every shelf location tagged in the SKU field under the title. So I know exactly where to find it. Um, unlisted books. Um, I, I put them in, in plastic tubs or cardboard boxes, and it just depends on how they fit. Sometimes they're laying flat. Sometimes they're standing upright. Um, and the tubs are labeled with, with authors or series or whatever. And as I or even just like Bibles, unlisted Bibles. Um, and then I will just label that tub what's in there. Um, and then once I've listed books, if it's a, a full set, a large set, and I don't want to take up shelf space with it, I will box it up and label the box. And I have a place to store my boxes. And again, I will record that location in the SKU field. So I know where to find that box when it sells. Okay. And here's a question you don't have to answer. Um, how many books are not listed? How many are in your death pile? Well, the 500 I just got from a from the science fiction paperback haul a couple of weeks ago are not yet listed. Um, and there's probably another couple hundred I have to get listed after that. Um, my, I'm way behind. I, I got hit with the flu in early December and I was sick for like six weeks until just like last week. And I, the only thing I did for eBay was ship. That's mm -hmm. all I did. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of lists. I'm behind in a lot of listing. And I, last year I started hiring my grandson to do photography for me and he's coming over tomorrow. And I think he's going to take one look at those books <laughs> and he's going to want to go right back home because I have so much <laughs> photography for him. But, um, but that has actually helped my log jam quite a bit um, mm -hmm. because that, that tends to be where I, I just kind of run into a wall is with the photography. Well, yeah, everybody does. And yeah. well, you're up there in Maryland where it's cold. So you'll have something to hunker down and do until that's, spring. <laughs> that's right. And, and I trained him exactly what book shots to get and how to do it. And he's he's gotten pretty fast at it. So that's good. Okay, good. Yeah. Um, here's another question. What is the biggest lot of paperback books or hardback books you have sold? Okay. Um, the... 
paperback books, it was a lot of Star Trek books. They basically put out a paperback for every episode of Star Trek. And there must have been close to 100 in that lot. And I will never do that again. <laughs> it was just very tedious. So when um, you shipped those, was it multiple boxes? Those I remember fitting into one box and it was, oh my gosh. It was heavy. But paperbacks are, you know. That's, no, that's true. So They're bad. probably, yeah. what, six or eight but, ounces? <sighs> It just depends. But yeah, so that was one large box. Um, and then the the hardbacks, I don't remember how many there were, but it was church hymnals. I got answered an ad off of Facebook Marketplace and paid, I think it was 40 bucks for a lot, like three, more than three boxes worth of, it was a lot of boxes of church hymnals. Mm -hmm. And they are very heavy. So I listed them and reboxed them. And a woman bought them for her church and she talked me down in price because it was for a church. <laughs> and I shipped the media mail and I didn't insure them. And it was three or four boxes. And one of the boxes was 43 pounds. I remember that really distinctly. And the post office dropped it. It broke open and half the books were lost from it. Ugh. So when she finally got the box, half the bo books were missing. I hadn't insured it. I had to refund her that. Um, so my lesson learned from that is I will no longer pack a book box that weighs more than 25 pounds. If it's more than going to be more than 25, it's going to it's gonna go in more than one box. Because I feel like if they drop that, it's just, even though I pack really tightly and I pack really well and I reinforce with tape, if they're dropping that from six feet high, that's going to bust right open. Yeah. So yeah. And some of the older books like church hymnals, or I've sold some books from the like some academic books from the 40s and even the 30s are extremely heavy, much heavier than today's hardcover books, the paper stock that they used. So I'm, I'm, you know, I'm conscious of weight as well. Mm -hmm. Now, can you go over your process if you ship one order in multiple boxes as far as the shipping labels? Yes, um, I, I use Pirate Ship. Um, I just find it easier to use than the eBay interface. When I'm listing, I decide how many boxes it's going to be in. And I pack those boxes and I weigh those boxes and I know what they will be, what they will cost for media mail. Uh, and then I will do one of two things. I will um, just do a flat rate media mail price. Let's say it'll be $40 to get these books to you to California. Um, and there's a, I think you can only go up to a $50 flat rate on media mail before, before the the uh, postage program say you can't you can't go any higher than that on a flat rate for media mail or, or whatever um so i'll do a flat rate it looks like a flat rate to the buyer but to me i i know what it's going to be um i'm trying to think what else i do that's pretty much what i do because otherwise it gets to oh or the other thing i will do is i will exaggerate the weight of the books let's say my books weigh 50 pounds, I will say they weigh 70 pounds because if I'm breaking it up into multiple boxes, it's going to cost more per box than if it were all in one box. And by saying it's 70 pounds when it's really only 50, and I'll play with the numbers a little bit and look at it, make sure I'm being pretty accurate to the buyer, what the buyer has to spend. Um, that will tell me, uh, that will tell the buyer, this is what you're going to pay. And they don't care how many boxes it comes in. Mm -hmm. So the all the labels are going to have a different tracking number, even though it's one order. That is correct. Right. Yes. So you, you kind of have to finagle that when you're printing the labels, but you need to know that when you're making the listing because yes. you got to have the weight right. But as far as long as they pay enough to cover the shipping, right. you kind of print the labels any way you want on the back end, just in correct. terms the tracking numbers. Um, so on eBay, you can only upload one tracking number though. No, you can upload multiple. Oh, you can. Okay. I guess yep. I've never done that. So I didn't yep. know. <laughs> yep. It's the drop down. After you add one traffic tracking number, you, you have a, like a something you click and you can add another one. Okay. Perfect. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Cause this, this is going to happen sometimes with big orders. Okay. Yes. Good to know. Okay. Um, and then we have another question, and you kind of covered this already. Is there a particular genre that sells better than others? And is there a genre to stay away from? Stay away from mass-produced books. So stuff that Costco sells. Stuff that, right. That's a really that is a great, 
a great way to frame that. Yes. So yeah, if they're 30 stacked, 30 high on right. Like don't Costco. bother with David Baldacci or Nicholas Sparks or James, James Patterson. Patterson. Yeah. The market is flooded. <laughs> they're great <laughs> authors, but it's just they're yeah. mass produced and they're not going to be worth they're not right. going to be worth your time. Yes. Yes. So what sells well for me is vintage science fiction and fantasy and is and paper and especially paperbacks um, in that genre. I think paperbacks are a very overlooked category. Uh, and I sell probably as many paperbacks as I do hardcovers. Um, if if you're in the science fiction and fantasy car- category and you're you're selling vintage ones like that are like pre 90s from 80s and 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 earlier um you've got your sci-fi nerds that are collectors and they just want those titles they want those old books and they they're just total geeks and i appreciate that they're geeks cuz they they really seek out those kinds of books um about, i think it was like 3 years ago i found a set of seven 1970s paperback books in a series by michael moorcock the Elric, El, I forget the name. Anyway, the Elric saga, something like that. Seven paperback books, $175. Nice. Right? So this is, this is, that's the mindset of, of people that are, that are buying those books. Um, vintage children's series do well for me in both hardcover and in um, paperback. Uh, some Bibles can do well. Some cookbooks can do well. And then I will 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 find obscure old antiquarian books that are you know a hundred years old or more, and they're weird. They're like um, old medical books with with creepy looking illustrations or <laughs> very found, primitive medical books. <laughs> right. I found a book from the from the eighteen eighties that was essays on the Reconstruction era, and I think that one sold for over a hundred dollars. Um. Books related to the Old South that are pre-1900 will do well. I sold a home ec textbook from the 50s for like $100. Um, so just this weird, obscure stuff. And then the other thing that I that I kind of stumbled upon this past in 2023 was in the Mid-Atlantic, there's a map company and they make county street atlases. Um, and it goes county by county and it's a street atlas. And they've been publishing those since the 70s. And I came across a stack of them at some book sale for 50 cents a pop. And I must, I don't know how many I bought, like 20, 30. And I started listing them for $25. And now when I come across them again, I'll I'll list them again. And they reliably sell for 18 to $25. They're super fast to photograph. And I've got one buyer, whenever I post a new batch, he'll, he'll, he won't even, and I always have make offer on the listing. He won't even make an offer. I'll just hear ka-ching, 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 ka-ching. About six hours after I've listed a batch, I'm like, oh, that's that guy again. And it's him. And I message him asking, why do you want all these maps with all, from all these different years? And he didn't answer me, but um, yeah. So they're, they've been selling for me. So just, you know, you never know what's going to sell. So you just like, check it out and and maybe you'll get successful with that. So what do you do with books that you acquire that are no good. Do you redonate them? I re- redonate unless they're just in such a horrible shape. I'll just throw them away. Do you donate them to places you don't shop at? No, I don't even <laughs> to places I do shop at. I do. I do that I for like- myself because I'm like, well, I might buy it again. I better donate it somewhere I don't go. <laughs> I'm, pr- I'm really good at, about remembering what sold and what didn't. So I, that hasn't been a problem for me. So yeah. that's good. Yeah. Okay. That's a good plan. Okay. Yeah. And then a couple more questions. Do you have a personal book collection? Yeah. <laughs> 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 um, both my husband and I, we're, we're kind of like book hoarders, um, but we have been really working hard to, to call that down. I've been selling some off. I've been donating some. He's been pretty good about doing the same. I think we're down to about 1500 books in our home library. I mean, at one time it was tw- easily twice that. So well, well, and you I- said at somewhere along the line that your kids were concerned about that. And you're like, you guys can just light a match. You know, they, they're gone. the ones that threatened it. Yeah. They said, we're going to light a match and walk away. Just, you know, burn, baby, burn. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. So we've been, we've been working on that and that's, we've been culling that down. Well, and I love books. Um, I don't have a whole lot because I keep moving. <laughs> it's like, um, you know, once I've read it, I 
re-donate it or whatever. But um, I love being in the library, just yes. surrounded by all the knowledge and the people who like to be in the library, yes. as well as you know bookstores. And I just I like the vibe in there. It's I totally like a weird I totally thing to like, that. I guess. But it's not because I'm exactly the same way. I just I like the people that like those things as well. So you know just. Um, wandering around the bookstore and just whatever catches your eye because there's always new stuff and um, there's just always something else to learn and I guess um, my my parents were readers so we had books we had, you know I used to sit around and just look through the encyclopedias as a small child yes and, um, just you know like get the x or the v and yep. just like, what words start with x and v so I could learn new words or the animals your friends <laughs> the animals that you know that were like you didn't know them it was just yeah. like from different countries or you know all all the you know African animals or whatever just I would just sit and look through it and that that's such a nerdy thing to do for a little kid but um you know there was no internet right we had three channels on tv and um we couldn't sit there and watch tv all day so you had to yeah. find to do and um other than, you know, putting my brother in a cardboard box and pushing him down the stairs, <laughs> like six flags. <laughs> he couldn't do that too many times. <laughs> so when I, when I was little, I'm one of four. And in the summers, every day after lunch, my mom would send us to our rooms where we had to read for an hour. Mm -hmm. And looking back on that now, it's not that she really wanted us to be reading. It's that she just needed some peace. <laughs> she needed a break. It was but for it, her, it made, not you. <laughs> it made all the kids in my family just love to learn to read for pleasure. I mean, we just, we're all good readers now. So um, I'm thankful for that. I just, you know, I can't imagine life without books. Well, and that's interesting. Um, Melanie, my daughter, um, was never really a reader um, because when you're in school, you're forced to read things right. you're not interested in. Like who cares right. about what the Civil War dates were? I want to know like, what did they wear? How did they yeah. cook? You know, um, how did they live? So she's become a reader in the last five years and she's reading two or three books a week um gets home from work and just is reading and so it it can find you later in life once you realize yes. you know she said I never knew reading could be so fun and interesting um because in school they just give you these assignments and you, you don't really want to do them they're just like this is so boring just I think we got to get them really young to, to 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 let them know how much fun reading really yeah. is yeah yeah maybe I wasn't a good parent like showing her how to read for pleasure but anyway it it caught up with her so that's great um I she sent me a picture of her closet and just like tubs and tubs of books and like, <laughs> I love that now you're a book person too that's right <laughs> So, that's great yeah okay and the last question is what are you reading right now um I am reading a fantasy novel by Brandon Sanderson called Warbreaker and it's about two kingdoms and one of the two daughters has been promised as the bride to the other kingdom and he sends the he's instead of sending the bride that was originally thought to go he sends the other one and magic and hijinks ensue so so I'm reading that I'm really enjoying that and then I'm, I've always got a fiction and a nonfiction going at the same time. And my nonfiction is the highly sensitive person. Oh, excellent. Which I just learned I am. That explains so much. And I'm really enjoying the book. So. Oh, yeah. that's wonderful. Yeah. I mean, I think um, there's a lot more of that now than there used to be. Um, yeah, we're aware of understanding it. Understanding yeah. empaths. And um, yes. you can look back over your life like I'm that way too. And I never liked going to the zoo because it would just make me cry. And I'm like, yeah, why? And, and I told my mom, I was like, those animals, they don't want to be in there. They don't yeah. like that. And I'm like, identifying with the animal in the cage. He doesn't like that. <laughs> the little kid. So everyone likes to go to the zoo. Well, not really. <laughs> so, yeah, I love, I'm going to look that book up. Um, do you do audiobooks too, or just read? I read do them? more and more because I, I try and get out and walk a lot. And that's what gets me through yes. Your podcasts and, and, and audiobooks. Yep. Yeah. Good. I like, uh, biographies that are read by the person yeah, yeah. it just and, there's there's a different energy there when they're reading it there is um, Patrick Swayze's uh autobiography was really good did he narrate uh, that yes he did really oh I'll have so, to get that yeah that's some ear candy for you 
<laughs> I'll bet. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, okay. Well, thank you for taking the time to come back on and answer some questions. Do you want to share the name of your store so people can look at it? Sure. Um, it's it. The name of the store is Chesapeake Traders. Okay. Okay. I can put that link below the podcast. Okay. So a lot of times guests don't want to share their store because they don't want to create local competition, but I think you have I'm such not, a well-defined business model. It's going to be really hard for anybody to, you know, you, you got to get out there and find it. Okay. okay. Well, thanks again. And uh, we will watch for more of your book sales and other sales um, on the Facebook group. Well, thanks, Suzanne. My pleasure. Have a great day. You too. Bye. There is not going to be a trivia question in this episode. It's more of a tutorial. Eileen and I were talking after the recording about using Terapeak on your phone to look up items when you're out in the field. And she didn't know how to do that. And I've really never done it. So I looked up the steps and I think this will be helpful. So this is more of a tutorial. To use Terapeak on your mobile phone. Open the eBay app, then go to My eBay at the bottom next to the home icon. On the next screen, choose Help, then search for Terapeak in the search bar. Choose the first option that pops up, and you'll get to a page that says Two Minute Article. Once on that screen, scroll down and look for the blue button that says Go to Terapeak Product Research. A web browser window will open and it looks just like what you see on the computer. You can enter your information and search. So if you were not aware of how to use Terapeak for research on your phone, now you are. Okay, next week, my guest is Diane in Mississippi. She is a retired teacher. Her specialty is jewelry, and she sells all kinds of other things as well. So make sure you tune in for that. Thank you for supporting this podcast, and I'll talk to you next week. Bye, everybody.